Valuation is a core component of every investment transaction and private equity is no different in this respect. There are really two fundamental techniques that you use to value companies and you will find these in finance textbooks and in practice. The first is discounted cash flow and the second is relative valuation using multiples. We will be using these also for private equity, but the way we do it will have a different twist for three reasons. The first reason is that private equity investment is based upon a strategy which results in an exit from the investment after three to seven years, and this will impact the valuation approach. The second reason the valuation approach of private equity will be specific is that in venture and growth, most of the companies may not be profitable or have positive cash flow at the time the investment is made, which makes valuation difficult using straightforward textbook methods. In buyouts, on the other hand, there will most likely be cash flow, but the effect of a leverage transaction may have to be taken into effect in the valuation. The third reason is that we will need to take into account the effect of injecting the private equity capital into the company, which is always the case in venture and growth. Before we get into private equity valuation, let's refresh ourselves on the basis of valuation. The two main techniques are discounted cash flow and relative valuation. Let's first consider DCF. In DCF valuation, we work with a set of forecasts of company financials from which we derive future cash flows, which can be either free cash flow to shareholders or free cash flow to the firm, namely both debt and equity holders. We discount these cash flows to the present by applying an appropriate discount rate, which can be estimated by referring to the stock market, the company's debt and equity levels, and the company's cost of debt. To the forecast flows, we add a terminal value, which is a value at the end of the forecast period, which expresses the value of the cash flows beyond the forecast period. Thus, the valuation we seek will be the net present value of these cash flows. This is the essence of DCF valuation. Let's now consider relative valuation. In the case of relative valuation, we apply a multiple to a relevant company metric. So at its simplest, we simply multiply two numbers by each other. The metric is a company result such as profit after tax for the last year or expected EBITDA for this year. In some cases, a non-financial metric is used like number of subscribers for a telecom company or number of hotel rooms for a hotel chain. The multiple is a figure derived from other com companies which can be considered comparable to the one we are trying to value, for which we already have a valuation either because they are listed on the stock market or they have been the object of a transaction in the M&A market. So if we take the example of a comparable listed company, we take the share price, multiply this by the number of shares in, issued by the company, which gives us total market capitalization, and then divide this by that company's profit after tax in order to get a price earnings ratio, PER. We repeat the exercise for other companies and take the average of the various PERs we have calculated and multiply the profit after tax of our company by this value and then get our valuation. So these are the two methods in theory. As you might imagine or know already, their effective practical application may not always be so straightforward, but we'll leave that discussion for a company valuation course given by somebody else. Now let us consider a private equity investment. We may f well face a choice. In the case of a buyout investment involving a larger, more mature company, the company will have profits and cash flows, and in addition, the private equity investment may not go into the company, but be used to purchase shares from existing shareholders. So two of the three complicating factors mentioned earlier fall away, leaving us just with the question of exit at the end of the investment period. In such a case, it is likely that the company can be valued using what we can call a classical approach. In the case of a leverage transaction, an LBO, instead of new equity going into the company, we will have the situation whereby a good part of the company's existing equity 
will be replaced by debt. This aspect will therefore need to be taken into account. Buyout investors will have a financial model, which they call an LBO model, into which they will plug in companies' numbers plus the effect of leverage, from which they will derive their valuation. They will model different scenarios for the company and the investment, optimistic forecasts or pessimistic forecasts, more leverage or less leverage in the transaction, and from this obtain a range of different values to consider. Let's now turn to the cases of growth or venture investments. In this case, all three of the complicating factors, lack of metrics, exit scenario, capital injected, are present. So now the valuation approach changes. Now we have to, so to speak, travel in time. We need to find out the valuation at the present time, but we do this by traveling to the future and then coming back again. We construct a set of financial forecasts which incorporate the investment the fund will make into the company. We go to the future, in which, which is known as the exit point, which we expect to sell the company and exit our investment. We value the company at that point in time using company metrics of that year to which we apply a multiple we derive from comparable companies today. This represents the proceeds we expect to receive at exit. We then discount this value back to the fund's target return to obtain a net present value today. Note that the discount rate of our fund's target return is not the same as the discount rate which is used in a classical valuation, but is a much higher value that encapsulates risks which are not accounted for by classical financial theory, such as company youth and survival risk. The net present value we obtain is known as the post-money valuation. This is the value of the company after the planned investment has gone in. Therefore, the pro forma pre-money valuation will be the post-money valuation minus the proposed investment into the company. Notice how the actual valuation is quite straightforward, being dependent simply upon the metric at exit time, the multiple applied, and the target discount rate. The obvious difficulty is in developing forecasts of the company without having much to go on in the way of historical figures to project off, which therefore requires a more creative approach. This is a key skill of a private equity fund manager, being able to visualize how a company will look in the future better than most other people. Having now established the value of a company, we now have to face the fact that private equity investment can take place using more complex financial instruments, such as preference shares with special features or mezzanine debt. Some companies may have several classes of shares and apportioning the value of the whole company among these can be very challenging. Also, private equity deal structures may have complicating factors that impact valuation, making it a less straightforward exercise than simply dividing up the value of 100% pro rata to say the number of shares. At this point, we should mention the importance of the valuation guidelines for private equity issued by IPEV. IPEV is a private equity professional association which publishes valuation and reporting guidelines for the industry and whose standards have gained wide acceptance in the industry. IPEV publications provide useful guidance helping to navigate all the twists and complexities of private equity instruments and deal structures, allowing us to perform more informed valuations. To conclude, if you can value private equity investments, you can for sure value anything.